God bless you all, and it's a real great honour to be here in Norway with you, and a great honour and a privilege to present God's Word. Um, this is something that we don't take lightly. You know, being able to share God's Word with people is a responsibility, and um, one which you guys as leaders understand that you are accountable for that what you teach and that it is as accurate as it possibly can be. And that we are not to lead people down a garden path and um, just tell them the things that they want to hear, um, that they're, they're loved of God, that they're gorgeous, that they're um, the best people on the face of the earth, that God created them, that God loves them. But there's other juicy bits within God's Word that sometimes is confronting in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Bible is actually made for the believer. <laughs> An unbeliever can't understand the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So there are things in here that, that are real juicy and beautiful, and there are others that sort of hit our hearts as individuals, and it brings us back to us correcting things in our lives that may not be right. You know, we are not perfect. We make mistakes. But that when we come together like this, and we encourage one another. That's how we overcome those uh, situations where we may not be perfect in our walk. But that every day is a new day and we can perfect that walk. First and foremost, it is me and God. Now I'm a married woman. Does Lawrence come before God? No. So my relationship with God first. Then it is Lawrence, not the children, although now I don't have babies, they're 30 and 28 and 25, they're grown up. But it's never the children next. It's your husband or your partner. And then it's the children. Then it's the fellowship. Then it's the believers outside that fellowship. And there's an order. And if that order isn't right, then things aren't going to go right for you. Now, if you're a single person, it's a little easier. It's you and God. And you perfecting that relationship with God in Christ in you. Please do not forget the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God put him there. And he's so important. He's the mediator between me and God. When I go to God, I go to him in the name of Jesus Christ, and it's a powerful name. You know, Jesus Christ should be your Lord. He should be the king of your life. He should be directing you. You involve him in your day-to-day -day things. As much as you go to God, you go to Jesus Christ. But, on that note, I just wanted to clarify so that, like for me, it's me and God, and then my husband, then my children, or grandchildren, which I'm very proud to say we have now, a beautiful granddaughter, Maya, <laughs> then the fellowship, then the believers. And when we get that priority and we get it right, everything flows so smoothly. You know, if I tried to put the kids before Lawrence, it may work for a little while, but then it's going to start going wrong because that's not how God designed it. And um, our husbands are, are very important. We don't put our husbands down, we, we rise, you know, we praise them up, we encourage them, they're the head of the house. They have an awesome responsibility before God. They really do. And um, even though the women are the guardians of the home, that doesn't make them the, the master of that home. So, uh, you know, there's certain, not that I'm pointing this at anybody here, but obviously this goes out over a blog as well. And so, you know, I just really felt the need that I needed to share that and so that people know that, you know, after us being married for 30 odd years, you can easily start to neglect that relationship. And, um, you know, you take one another for granted and mm. things don't always... Uh, where we have our busy lives, we may not take time to tell one another that you love each other. And, but it is so important. It really is so important. And, 
it's not until they're not there that you realise what you did have. So all you married women and you married men, uh, you know, you hold on tight to what you do have, keeping God first. But I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke, please. And uh, I know my husband shared this a little while back, but I wanted to reliterate on it, and it's uh, very poignant. So Luke chapter 4, and uh, in verse 18 it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And you can put your name in there. You know, that word me could say the Spirit is, a, is upon Kim, or the Spirit of the Lord is upon Lawrence, or Siri, Frisanna, whoever. Because there's always a, a reason why God does something. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive and the recovering of sight to the blind, and the big one, to set at liberty them that are bruised. You know, we can have situations go on in our lives, and we may feel we're trapped, but we're nowhere near as trapped as someone that doesn't have the freedom um, to live life. And they certainly are bruised people. You know, actually seeing the sight of someone coming back that's been blind for many years is a pretty wholesome, you know, when they, it's been dark for so long and then they get ministered to and their their sight is recovered. I remember a guy in France, actually, we were at a big meeting there and um, he was from the Congo, Congo. Mm -hmm. and he had been told to come to Paris um, for a certain uh, special laser treatment on his eyes because in one eye he was totally blind mm -hmm. and in the other eye he, he saw shadows. And at the time, France had uh, come up with this new treatment that could actually restore the sight through laser. So he'd gone and seen this consultant, and unfortunately, um, after the consultant had looked in his eyes and seen how bad they were, he said, I'm very sorry, but there's nothing we can do for you. And the guy left the building very upset. I mean, he'd travelled a long way and it was cost a lot of money. The people in the village had all chipped in for him to, to get this trip and to get this treatment. And as he, as he was walking down the steps coming out of the consultation, he bumped into this lady. And obviously his eyesight wasn't good, but this lady recognised him. I mean, on the streets of Paris, the guy's from Togo. That's it, Togo. Yeah. That's it, Togo. And he said... I can't remember his name, but say his name was John. John, what are you doing in Paris? Mm. And she explained who she was, and he explained his situation and how mm. his eyesight had failed him over the years. And she said, I am on my way to a fellowship. Mm -hmm. And there are some believers that have come from the United Kingdom, and they have awesome stories on God's healing and deliverance. Why don't you come with me? Mm. And he said, well, I have nothing to lose. I believe God got me here this far for a purpose. Mm. So maybe it's not the consultant I need to see. Maybe it's the fellowship. So he comes to the fellowship. And uh, Lawrence shared, I shared, and we had our son, Danny, who at the time was 15 years old. And Danny shared. And afterwards, this gentleman just really felt drawn to Danny. Mm -hmm. And so he said to Danny, I would like you to minister. I'm blind in one eye, and I have only shadows in this eye. Mm -hmm. And Danny said, no problem, man. He said, God can heal you. I mean, 15 years old. You know, no fear, no like, oh shit, what do I do? <laughs> he said, come with me. So into the room, and Danny just placed his fingertips on the guy's eyes mm -hmm. and he commanded in the name of Jesus Christ and the first time Danny took his hands away nothing happened mm -hmm. and Danny said well you know I know that God can heal you man it's you the problem lies with you you're fearing <laughs> and the guy said well I so want to see and I don't know if this is going and Danny said I'm telling you this is going to happen. 
and we will not leave this room until it does. And the guy said, okay, man, I'm with you. So Danny ministered again. And the eye that only saw shadows, he could see. Could see open people. His eyes, would he, for about 45 yeah, minutes? Yeah, for about 45 minutes he wouldn't open his eyes because he was afraid he wouldn't see anything. And Danny kept working with him, but when he finally opened his eyes, the eye that he saw shadows, he could see. And the eye that he was totally blind, he only saw shadows. And Danny said to him, this is how God has done it. Because when you fly back home, and your feet land on your land, you know, on, in your area, and the people come to visit you, and you tell them that this eye is shadows, and this eye you can see. now see, mm. as soon as you speak those words, and the people are listening, God will totally restore that vision in front of your people. Mm. Oh. Wow. And afterwards, Danny was like, I don't even know why I said that. Mm. He said, but that's what God's telling me to tell you. Mm -hmm. And he flew home. And we actually did hear back from him that when his feet landed, after the plane landed and he got off the plane and there was people there to see him, he shared what Danny told him. That the eye that he only saw shadows had perfect vision. And the eye that he couldn't see at all, he could see shadows. And as soon as he shared that, he had total restoration of eyesight in his left eye. So, you know, we are there to, to, to enhance people's faith that healing is available. We are to preach these testimonies so that it builds faith in people. Um, you may not have had any serious illness. You may not have had any serious disease. But it still doesn't mean that you cannot minister the power of God. You know, when I was diagnosed with cancer, and I mean, it's a long story and it's not worth really um, wasting time tonight, but it gives you like a longing to make sure that other people aren't suffering. When you're told you have three months to live and you, you try to squeeze everything in that three months and then you don't die, mm -hmm. it's like, well, when is it going to happen? It's something that you as a person have to drive and push your way through. That actually taking the mind off yourself and putting it onto mm. someone else, healing other people, preaching the gospel. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to be like the crazy woman mm. or the crazy man in the town centre, like mm. the town crier. Oh yay, oh yay, I'm a God believer. You can be, you don't have to do that, mm. but you incorporate it into your day-to-day -day living. Mm. You are not ordinary yeah. people. It's not that you get up in the morning and you pray. And then you go to work. And you do your job. Then you go to lunch. <laughs> and then you think, oh, I might speak in tongues in my lunch break. <laughs> oh, I better go back to work. Back to work. You do the rest of your job in the afternoon. And then you're out of work. Oh, I've got to get the bus home. And you're sat on the bus, what am I going to have for tea tonight? I wonder what Lawrence would want to eat tonight. Um, oh, oh, I can't be bothered. I think I'll just get chip shop tonight. And, and then you arrive at home and it's, oh, I'll put the dishwasher on. Oh, I'll put the washing machine on. Oh, I'll quickly hoover around and put the dinner out. Oh, I need to really relax. I'm going to watch a bit of TV for an hour now. And before you know it, it's bedtime. <laughs> that is one ordinary life one terribly boring life terribly boring and God has not given us that ordinary life we are peculiar people we have to shake it up guys we have to make it more fun life is about living not just doing the mundane boring things day in day out you are special magnificent people how about instead of when you're on that train coming home and you're sat there thinking, well, I wonder what Lawrence wants for tea tonight. And, oh, and I've got the washing to do. And, oh, I've got to make sure that I get the meat out of the freezer. And why not ask somebody next to you, how are you today? How did your day go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that person could be hurting. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And while you're thinking about yourself and what you need to be doing, God might be working in you to actually minister or speak to that person. Mm. It's not that you have to shout from the rooftops. Mm. Preaching is actually holding forth, telling. Mm. You don't have to have a big mouth to tell the person next to you, did you know that just a few years ago I got born again? Mm. Okay. And it's been the greatest thing in my whole entire life that God has delivered me and my family. Mm. You know, I've been delivered of cancer. I've had um, cancer in my spine and I was supposed never to walk and now I'm healed. And, and all these things have gone on. I've got a beautiful family. I've got three kids. I've got a beautiful husband. We travel the world. We share. But there's so much you can fulfill and tell about your life because it is so much more than ordinary. Mm. You are not ordinary. You have a story to tell, even if it's how the day you got born again, how God brought you into the family of God. That is a story to tell, and usually it's a very exciting story because people have had hardships and they've gone through certain things and then suddenly somebody shares the word of God with you. But see, if that person hadn't spoken to you, where would you be now? Mm. I'm sure God would have found a way. He'd have got someone else. But what if you have an urgency to speak to someone and you don't? Mm. And then you get home and think, I should have spoke to that person. I should have told. Don't worry, guys. All right? God never, ever made a failure. He would back it up. Somebody else would come along and, and, and share the word with them. But don't be afraid to preach. Don't be afraid to teach people. Share the word of God. Share your life. Share it with people. Because there's people out there hungering and thirsting after that righteousness. And this is what the word tells us. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me. See, God didn't make a failure. It's upon you. And it's in you. You can herald forth. He's anointed you to preach the gospel, the gospel, the good news. <coughs> and I think it's funny how it says to the poor. Because do you know what? These rich people with their yachts and their Mercedes and their Bentleys, and they think they got it all. They don't think they need God. And it's not until this huge crisis comes into their lives, usually, when they think, oh, and their money can't buy them salvation, and their money can't buy them out of their situation, then they usually call. Oh. <coughs> but it says, we're gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And how many people in this world do you think, right now, are brokenhearted? Millions. Mm -hmm. So don't try and tell me that you went out in search to witness to someone today and you couldn't find anyone because I won't believe you <laughs> to preach deliverance to the captives you know sometimes we don't see the problems that people are bearing because they're good at hiding them but God knows who they are my daughter rang me yesterday and she said mum I'm so sad she said because the news there was a homeless guy and, and she, does she doesn't know him, but like she's seen him. He actually sleeps in the doorway of Primark in Bristol. And uh, he's always there, always, like if he's not right outside, he'll be very close to this shop. And um, the people that work in Primark had turned up at the, to unlock the doors and this guy's in their doorway and they tried to move him and he, he passed away in the night through hypothermia. It was minus eight. And um, she said, I'm so sad that in this day and time, in the year 2016, that young boys and young girls are still living on the streets and they're dying through being so cold and they don't have a home. They don't have a family that love them. And she said, I just want to say I love you, Mum, that I am so thankful for you and Dad. So you know there are people out there that are dying unnecessarily and, and need to hear the word. The recovering of sight to the blind, like I said, with the guy with Danny, mm -hmm. and to set it liberty. You know, we live in the United Kingdom and we have a lot of liberty. And I think you guys here in Norway have a lot of liberty too. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have the laws and we have certain rules that we have to abide by. 
but it's certainly not like some countries, you know, where genocide goes on and, you know, we put ourselves in those situations. Um, it blessed my heart, actually. We were at McNeil's the other day and she had a girl there from Rwanda. And uh, I don't know her, but I know what went on there. And my mm. heart went straight out to her, mm. you know, that she certainly didn't have liberty. And what those people live through over there is just horrific. So don't ever think that you are, your situation's bad, <laughs> you know, because there's someone out there far worse off than us. And we do have liberty. And we can give that liberty to others too. You know, when you, we are a gentle people, you know, we have God's love and that makes us unique, mm. that we can walk and we can hold our heads high, but that, that, that love compasses. When we speak God's word, it, it folds in on people like physical arms around someone, you know, and we all want to be loved. We mm. all need to be loved because that's the type of person that God created us. We all want to feel that somebody loves us. Mm. You know, if we've been busy and we haven't had a chance to speak to one another like much, very much one day, I still need to fill his arms around me to know that, you know, he loves me and he's there to um, encourage me and build me up. But if you don't have that, it's a pretty lonely life, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And having a believer, and it doesn't have to be that you, you have a man's arms around you, just having a hug from another female Christian is just so warm mm. and inviting too. You know, something like I've seen Siri for the first time in I don't know how long, and when she put her arms around me, there's something about that that connection of being b believers. Mm. You know, that we know we're back home, we're back, we're safe, we're together. Mm. You know, so it's not always about <coughs> talking, but that love of God that just compasses and enfolds us and takes care of every problem that we we can imaginably think that we have it's nothing compared to how someone without that without god's love in their life is living you know we have god we can turn to him but if you don't have god then you feel pretty empty and pretty lonely so we need to preach we need to tell people acts chapter 10 matthew mark luke and john acts Mm -hmm. Right, I'm going to speed up here. Acts chapter 10, <clears throat> and in verse 38, it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. See, great example there. Here we know that Jesus Christ was anointed, not with just Holy Spirit, but with power. Same as us today, right? You believe, Romans 10, 9 and 10, you believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, mm. then he anoints you. Holy Spirit now dwells within, and man, that power is untouchable. Mm -hmm. It is untouchable. You know, like Supergirl, or Spider-Man, or whatever. Power is bigger than that. You can climb buildings. You can fly through the air. You can, because the power of God doesn't just stop. It cuts through everything, like a knife through butter. That power is undeniable. We have seen people dead, 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 <laughs> risen from the dead. We've seen the blind actually physically see. We have seen people that have had um, paralysis get up and walk. People that have had crutches throw down the crutches and walk. We've had people that have been broken hearted on the brink of suicide turn their whole lives around. Because that power of God, mm. when spoken on the lips of believing, mm. just melts all the rubbish. And the adversary, yes, he's out there. <laughs> but greater is he this in you than he this in this world. Yeah, he can fire a few little darts at you and put a few little doubts, but never, ever, ever doubt the power of God. You speak those words, even if you're afraid that nothing's going to come out. 
as soon as you open your mouth, God will fill it and mm. he will tell you what that person needs to hear. Mm. That's the power of God. Mm. So how God, you've seen what Jesus Christ's done. Jesus Christ's life was an example. He was one selfless man. Mm. He was a man. He walked this earth. But he didn't always think about himself. In fact, I don't think he ever thought about himself. It was God first. God, what do I do today? He wasn't an ordinary person. He didn't get up in the morning and think, oh, I'm so tired, I can't, I need to go back to bed for an hour. Right? He got up and he had things to do and things to accomplish that day. And probably for him, 24 hours was never enough. He probably needed, I don't know, 72 hours in one day for everything that he had accomplished. But you've now got him living in you, so how much more can you accomplish in 24 hours? You know, I think sometimes I need 72 hours in my day because there's so much I want to achieve, there's so much I want to do, and I'm ageing. Yes, okay, you may all say, oh, you look so young, but in my mind I still feel 18, but in my body I'm like 15. I'm like 65. <laughs> my body's slowing down, but my mind is still active. And I still yeah. want to do these things. So, okay, I might need to just slow down a little bit, you know? But it doesn't mean to say, because I'm 52, I have to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think that word's ever been in my vocabulary, though, has it? Lawrence says, love, can you sit down for a minute? He said, you go up and down, up. He said, and as I'm watching... You're hypnotising me, and I feel rather tired. <laughs> anyway, Acts chapter 1. Let's quickly read on through here. So Jesus Christ lived a remarkable life. Don't you want to live a life like he did? Don't you want to heal the blind and raise the dead and be so in tune with God? You know, to be so in tune with God that you know that God is telling you to go in a direction to go and heal someone. Or that God's putting you in a direction to, to, to actually bring liberty to some unbeliever. That you're going to get someone born again if you just go to the local shop. You know, they might think that you're nutty. Because when I first met Lawrence, I thought he'd been... Um, let out of the nutty asylum. You know, he was totally nuts the nuts, this man. <laughs> First words he said to me is, I'm going to marry you. God told me I'm going to marry you. Well, nobody <laughs> says that, do they? Unless they've come out of a mental institution. <laughs> you know. And here we are, 30 years later. How mental's that then? <laughs> God knew. Acts chapter 1. Where am I at? Chapter 1 and in verse 8. But, in contrast to what was written previously, you'll have to read it, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Okay, and then it stops there, does it? Once you get born again, you know, you receive Holy Spirit and that's it. Okay, well I'm fine. I'm born again. Sod everyone else. Don't matter, but I'm saved. That's all that matters. No, it doesn't say that. And it says, and you, put your name in there, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So that means like Norway. That's an uttermost part of the earth, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, especially if you live up north. America, Trinidad, Tobago, I don't know, Mauritius, Bahamas, uttermost parts of the earth. You will be witnesses. For you to be a witness, that means you have to hold forth something. You have to show something. Mm. You know, when you're in a dock in the police, in the courts, and you've got to be a witness for an incident, you have to stand up on the dock and you have to say, I am a witness to this accident or whatever, and this is what I saw, and this was the day and the time, and I saw that guy hit that car, and... That guy he didn't get up, you know, and but before the accident, they were ranting and raving. There was road rage. He's a witness to the accident. You're a witness to the, the born again. You witness your life, what it is to be a Christian, what it is to, to be 
part of the household of God, what it is to be loved by God, what it is to be loved by the people in your fellowship. You have to witness that. You have to show people. Mm. See, it's not just getting born again and then doing nothing. Do people at work know who you are? Do they know that you're a believer? Well, I'm sure they do in her case, but <laughs> she's, she's an exception. But yeah. do they know? Yeah, we're not, we're not taking her into this conversation because we all know, everybody knows who she is, right? But do people know that you are a Christian? Do, are you afraid to tell people that you're a Christian? Are you afraid to say, hey, I'm a born again believer and I've got power from on high mm -hmm. and I can make your pains or your aches or your broken arm or your eyesight healed do people know who you are because mm. if they don't and you're afraid to speak and you're afraid to say well hey i'm a christian then something's wrong mm -hmm. you you are not being a great witness unto the lord jesus christ <laughs> and unto god mark matthew mark luke mark chapter 16 not hard to be a witness. Mm -hmm. Share your life's testimony. Mm -hmm. Share it with people. Just begin. And if you don't know where to begin, start at the beginning. Start on the day that you got born again. Can everybody remember the day they got born again? Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, Britt? No. No? I was too small, I guess. Too it, small? It was too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair enough. <laughs> right, for most of us, I was... Well, actually, I got born again when I met Lauren. <coughs> 31 years ago. 32 years ago, maybe. Um, I knew about God. My nan shared little bits with me, but um, I didn't know an awful lot. I knew that God was a good God. Um, I knew that I was God's child. And I think that's about it. And then when I met Lawrence, and at first, after I got over the initial shock of him being a complete and utter <laughs> nutcase, um, there seemed to be so many truths coming from his mouth, and that not that he knew all the word, because he didn't. He was in search himself, like he loved God, and he was born again, but um, he was in search of the accuracy of God's word. That's that's the right word. In been to many churches, many denominations, but he was actually searching for the truth. Mm. And um, I, I started to listen to things he was sharing and then I, I knew there was a God, but I never thought that I needed him. I didn't see that I was like, you know, I, I was the poor or the needy. I never saw myself within the Bible. I had a great family upbringing. I had my family around me who loved me, we had, we were financially secure and I thought that God was there for the people that were, that had nothing, that were down and out and downtrodden and I didn't think that God needed me. So <laughs> how, how wrong I was that I needed God, not that he, God needed me, but anyway, that, that was my mentality and then when Lawrence started to share and I was listening to his, his words and we started to go to church and we went to many different churches and um, I could never see Jesus Christ as God because how could Jesus Christ who is a baby in a manger be God mm -hmm. uh, I mean I had lots of different hang-ups and concepts of what Jesus Christ was and who God was and anyway we went in search together and it was great because there was questions that Lawrence had that he couldn't answer mm -hmm. and there was questions I had that Lawrence couldn't answer so together we went in search and um, we went to this little home fellowship after all the churches we'd gone to mm -hmm. we went to this little home fellowship mm -hmm. and there was five children mm -hmm. five little children sat on the carpet and they sang the B-I-B-L-E yes that's the book for me I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And I just broke down crying. Mm. I mean, that touched my heart beyond any words. And I thought, I want that for my kids. I want my kids to want to know about God and to love God mm. and to 
oh my god it just that family just really really changed our lives mm. and a dad just sat there like we're sat here now and he just shared god's word with such love I mean, he was. He used to belong to the IRA. Do you all know who the IRA is yes. in Ireland? You know, yeah. Yeah. but he used to belong to the IRA mm -hmm. and uh, rough, tough Irish man. But my God, when he opened his mouth and spoke the word of God, it just melted you. Mm -hmm. His love for God and the way that he had passed that down to his children. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the night I got born again. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was phenomenal that you didn't need to be in a church, that being in an environment like this, you could get born again. It was just how God utilized it to be so easy and so simple. <clears throat> and that family changed my life. We still know them now and the kids are grown up now and they all grew up together and it was wonderful. But, you know, that was when I got born again. And I remember that like it was yesterday. Obviously, I was older and I could remember that. But for you guys, if you weren't that young that you don't remember, you know, it's, it's good to tell your tales. Let people know how you got born again and, <coughs> and how God introduced the word to you. It's, uh, it's pretty humbling, actually, you know, to think that I didn't need God. And here I am all these years later and learning the truths about what it is to know God and to know his word. Anyway, Mark... Matthew, Mark. No, let's turn to Romans. Acts, Romans, chapter 1. We're going to finish off here. Romans 1. And in verse 16 it says, For I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We can't be ashamed to speak that word, guys. Mm. Lawrence is known as the preacher man where we live mm -hmm. because everywhere he goes he preaches everywhere he um, in fact we were in Staple Hill not very long ago and he Amber's sister's dating this guy he's not very mm. nice guy but um, and he's notorious a notorious evil person mm. his family is very evil mm. and people sort of cross the road rather than walk on the same path as him because they're fearful of him I mean his face <coughs> is covered in tattoos he's uh, <laughs> he's real tough nut anyway um, Lawrence had gone for his breakfast and uh, he bumped into him of course Lawrence doesn't cross the road <laughs> Lawrence comes face to face how are you, man? And the bloke's looking at him like, I'm all right. Who are you? <laughs> and Lawrence said, you know, I'm Danny's dad. And then he started, oh, well, people that know Danny have a lot of respect. And um, so straight away he said, oh, how are you doing, man? And Lawrence mm -hmm. said, you need God in your life. <laughs> and this big hard nut guy went, what? He said, you need, come round here. He said, I need to speak to you. And uh, Lawrence thought, my God, where's he taking me? And down the lane they went. Well, you don't go down the lane with this notorious nutter, you know, that pulls guns out and shoots people or pulls a knife and knifes people and just leaves them in the gutter to die. So Lawrence followed him down into this lane and he broke down crying. Hmm. Hard nut. Totally known for his bad behaviour and how evil he is. Hmm stood in front of Lawrence and broke down crying. Mm. Power of God. Mm. Mm. See, so it doesn't matter how hard they think they are. The inside, these guys do have a heart. And it's all an act when they're in front of their friends and they're in front of people. It's an act. Because mm. God didn't create humans to, to have a heart of rock. Mm. Mm. So nobody is everybody's touchable nobody's untouchable mm. you know you might see someone that doesn't look desirable but it doesn't mean that if <coughs> God's telling you to speak you speak mm. <coughs> that person needs to hear the word mm. and uh, it was a touching moment for you wasn't it oh. sharing that word with him mm. 
touched his life. And, uh, <coughs> for it is the power of God unto salvation that everyone that believeth, to the first the Jew and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Mm. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Mm. And if you finish off, we're going to go to Philippians. Uh, chapter 1. And in verse, let's start in 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. You know, the more we speak, the more our faith increases. Mm. We might feel a little unsure when we first start really holding forth the word of God, but the more we do it, the more confidence we get from God. Mm. And then when you start to see things happening, faith increases, and then you realise that power of God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Only, and that your, sorry, verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Mm. See, we have to rejoice. Every day is a great day. I'll tell you what, some people say to me, well, I don't have anything to be thankful for. And I say to them, when you got up this morning and you climbed out of bed, were you breathing? And they say, well, yeah. I say, well, you have something to be thankful for then. <laughs> because I'm telling you, somewhere, someone somewhere in this world didn't climb out of bed this morning and they aren't breathing. Only climbing out of bed is good. <laughs> Even the climbing out of bed is good, whether you're breathing or not, yeah. <laughs> Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit and in one mind, striving together, for the faith of the gospel. Mm. We strive together, whether we're in Norway, whether we're in Bristol, whether we're in Timbuktu. We are striving together. There's nothing new. Every day is a different day, but there's nothing new. There's always challenges, there's always obstacles, there's always not enough time, especially if you're a woman, there's never enough time in the day. But we have to furtherance this gospel. Somebody has to stand up and proclaim mm -hmm. that God is good. That Jesus Christ is your Lord. Mm -hmm. That healing is available. Mm -hmm. That you are a mighty people. That you're not Mr. and Mrs. Ordinary. So thank you. Amen. Amen.